Hi, this is Mrs. McConnell again, and this is the third round in my What Can Art Teach Us About History series. Here is the essay you will write at the end of this lecture and discussion. Uh, it's in your notes, too. It's basically the same essay that you wrote about Egyptian art, just this time Chinese art. So we began our art series with the cave paintings in Lascaux, and we learned that prehistoric artists were willing to use a great deal of a resource necessary for survival, animal fat, to make paint that would stick to cave walls. And what did that tell us? It told us that the cave art was very, very important to these prehistoric people. They were willing to use scarce and valuable resources. So that's true even if we don't know exactly what it meant. Next, we looked at Egyptian art. Remember what this is and why it was important? This is the Palette of Narmer, the oldest labeled work of art in existence today. It celebrated the unification of Lower and Upper Egypt, and it included various symbols that showed the pharaoh's godlike status. So, it helps teach us about the central role that the pharaoh played in Egyptian culture, and about the Egyptian gods and their close relationship to the pharaoh. Now, I'm not going to go back through all those other pieces of Egyptian art, promise. But I do want to remind you of a problem I ran into when I graded some of your essays. Some of you basically wrote an internet-based report on the work of art you chose, and in the process didn't actually answer the question, which was to explain what the work of art taught about the culture. I think that's an understandable error. I'm guessing you wrote a lot of middle school reports that way. But you need to be very, very careful about just downloading information from the web, even if you change some or most of the words. That's plagiarism, and it can get you in a lot of trouble in college. You also need to be very careful about reading and answering the actual question that your teacher or later professor asks. For this essay, Ms. Jacobs and I are going to help you resist the internet temptation by making this an internet-free assignment. You will write your essays by hand with devices closed, but you can use any and all notes that you take on this lecture and your class discussions. Back to the actual essay question. I'm not looking for a long essay. You'll see that I gave you just one lined page to write on, but I will be grading your essays based on how clearly you answer the question and how well you support your answer with specific evidence from the work you've chosen or from what you've learned about Chinese history. You'll have the images of the works in your notes, so the description should not be that difficult. But note that your description needs to include the art's function, as well as what it looks like. Why was this work created? What was it used for? As I go through the works of art, I will be giving you a lot of information that you can use on this essay. Take notes, okay? Because you will be able to use the notes on the essay. We're going to start with the first Chinese dynasty that we know from historical records actually existed, the Shang Dynasty. As you can see from this map, this was a northern dynasty. The modern capital of China, Beijing, is also in the north. I've circled it on the green map, so this is the heart of Chinese culture. So, what do you remember about the era of the Shang Dynasty? I've included some hints on the slide. Well, Shang Dynasty China was very hierarchical. That meant that people fit into strict social categories with the king on top. Uh, the title emperor, by the way, would come later. Shang Dynasty China was technologically advanced, especially in working with bronze metals. It was very warlike. Check out that bronze dagger. We also know from the oracle bones found in Shang tombs that Shang kings had scribes carve important questions into bones. When should we plant crops? Should we go to war next week? That sort of question. Then they heated the bones and used the cracks that appeared to consult with their ancestors about what to do. The Shang believed in a number of gods, but they did not try to contact those gods directly. They asked their ancestors to do the contacting for them. The most important Shang tomb that archaeologists have found is the tomb of a warrior queen, Fu Hao. The oracle bones mention that she was actually a general who led several military campaigns. We learned something else from her tomb, but let's watch the video clip and see. So most of these works were excavated from tombs, including Hu Fao's tombs. These are bronze ritual vessels that were used 
as libation, that means drink offerings to the gods, or to contain food offerings as well. Some were even used to heat this food. It's like sacrificed humans, yum. These bronze works were very intricate, and producing them required a complicated, expensive, and time-consuming process. So what do you think? Why did they bury such incredibly beautiful and expensive works of art in tombs? Because the Shang believed in the afterlife, and especially that their ancestors continued to intervene in their lives after death, they thought very seriously about burial and what would accompany the deceased to his or her grave. It was very important that the dead felt honored and satisfied, or else. And this was especially true for kings and queens. The Shang-era Chinese believed that the king's right to rule, what would later be called the mandate from heaven, was based on his good relations with the spirits of his ancestors, because it was they who controlled the destiny of his kingdom. The Shang Chinese also believed that it was the king's duty to please the great forces of nature, especially the sun and rain gods, who controlled the outcome of the harvest. And this was a matter of life and death to people. To make sure that these gods and the spirits of his own ancestors would look favorably on his kingdom, the king would make regular sacrifices of wine and cereals, which were placed in these elaborate bronze vessels and heated over the fires on the temple altar. Here you get a closer look at the bronze Guang ritual vessel, which is included as one of the works of art in your notes. One of the most characteristic designs on Chinese bronzes is the Tao Ti figure. I've circled it here so you can identify it. And we're going to look at this more closely in the next slide. The word Tao Ti is often translated as gluttonous ogre. So what's a glutton? A glutton is someone who eats too much. Gluttony is actually one of the seven deadly sins. So, any guesses as to what ancient Chinese legend says that this ogre liked to eat? Well, if you guess people, you're right. Art historians think this figure is probably a god that the ancestors needed to propitiate. That means to keep from getting angry. So, what does archaeological evidence suggest about how Shang rulers kept this god from getting angry? Well, remember those human sacrifices found in the tomb? By the way, I should emphasize we don't really know that this is the meaning of the Tao Te. The oracle bones are only written record of this culture. Don't say for sure. In actual Shang Dynasty tombs, by the way, the bronzes would be grouped together on an altar to the gods. Uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York has exhibited those, has an exhibit that shows how these different vessels would be grouped. If you have time, you may not. This is a fun website that lets you build your own bronze. I'm mostly skipping over the Zhou Dynasty, even though it's very important to the development of Chinese culture. It was during this dynasty that the notion of the Mandate of Heaven first appeared. The Zhou basically thought the Shang had lost it, thanks to the last Shang king's drunken orgies. And the new Zhou rulers used this doctrine to justify overthrowing the Shang king. The Zhou dynasty is also when the most important philosophies of Confucianism and Taoism first appeared. They're going to show up in Chinese art, but mostly a little later. In terms of art, the most famous Zhou works continue to be bronze goods designed for burial tombs, temples, and even wealthy homes. The Zhou apparently loved music and produced these magnificent bronze bells. The next dynasty was very short, but very powerful. You can see from the map how much of China its emperor Shi Huangdi conquered and the length of the Great Wall that he built. Okay, you've already learned a lot about his amazing sculpture army, so I'm not going to spend time describing what you're seeing. What do you remember about Emperor Qin and his short but very important dynasty? Well, Qin was a legalist. That means he thought that the emperor needed to be tough and enforce the law. Legalists basically believed that emperors held on to the mandate of heaven by winning battles and by keeping control over unruly subjects. So instead of vessels to feed ancestors, uh, Qin prepared to enter the afterlife with an army at his back. Keep in mind, too, that these soldiers are full size or larger than full size. It would have taken an army of sculptors to create this clay army for burial. More evidence that the Qin Empire was a well-organized bureaucratic state ruled by a powerful king, who is now called an emperor, by the way. 
Note, too, that while this emperor is more concerned with defending enemies than he is with feeding his ancestors, he still thinks he needs grave goods to accomplish tasks beyond the grave. So, there's still a belief in an afterlife. One of the really amazing features of this army is just how individual the faces look. Now, some historians think they may have been modeled after actual soldiers in Qin's army, but the most common belief is that the faces were deliberate stereotypes designed to show a variety of types of Chinese faces that reflected uh, the different regions that Chinese soldiers came from. It's possible to look at these faces if you know something about Chinese ethnography or the study of the Chinese people and know what regions they represented. So why might the emperor want to show a variety of people in his army? Well, we don't really know for certain, but maybe he was making the point that he had unified the nation and recruited soldiers from all over China. Another interesting point about this work is that originally these soldiers were equipped with real weapons, and most of them were later looted in order to use them to fight real battles. Clearly, Emperor Qin was expecting some trouble in the afterlife. Maybe he thought the ancestors wouldn't be entirely pleased with his rather brutal methods. The Han Dynasty was long and very important, so important that the Chinese still refer to themselves as Han Chinese. This is the period when the important philosophy of Confucianism really took hold in China. Unfortunately, we don't have that many works of, of Confucian-inspired art from the Han Dynasty era itself. Most of it dates from later dynasties. But before I turn to later Confucian art, let me quickly show you one interesting work from Han China. It's not one of the works I'm listing for the essay, so it's not in your notes. This is a funeral banner that was found in the tomb with many other burial goods and a well-preserved female corpse. This banner was draped over her sarcophagus, or coffin. The top section represents heaven, the bottom part represents earth, and in the middle you see dragons, which live in both realms, traveling back and forth. That, by the way, is why dragons show up so much in Chinese art. Like angels, they connected earth with the heavenly realm. Think of how often you see angels in Christian art. So here's a detail from the funeral banner, which I included so you can see the dragons better. Basically, we see here that the Han Chinese continued to believe in an afterlife and that there is lots of contact between the realm of the ancestors and the earthly world. Okay, I'm skipping over several dynasties in a period when China was divided between warring kingdoms. My focus here is on art and Chinese culture, not on giving you Chinese history blow by blow. The Tang Dynasty is important for my purposes because it produced two important, it produced important art reflecting two Chinese philosophical and religious traditions, Confucianism and Buddhism. The Tang capital of Chang'an was the greatest city in the world during the 7th and 8th century. It was a center of learning and art. So the painter of this scroll, and this was part of a long scroll that was used to educate young people about the expectations uh, that Confucian society had of them. So this painter, again, according to tradition, was actually a prime minister. That is the emperor's most important government official. Prime minister is really a Western term, but the equivalent of that, chief minister. So right off the bat, what does this tell you about Chinese culture, that we have a painting by a very high government official? Well, Confucian society valued cultural and educational attainments very highly. You've learned about the competitive exams to become a bureaucrat, right? Those tests were all about understanding Confucian texts, and in fact, this was part this, this drawing, this painting, was part of that educational process. The scroll was made with ink on silk. Silk was a very important Chinese product, highly valued by the rest of the world. China tried for a very long time uh, to keep the rest of the world from learning how to make silk. The scroll that this painting is part of actually shows 13 emperors, starting with the Han Dynasty, moving up to the Tang Dynasty. Each emperor is shown as larger than the people around him. That emphasizes his importance. In art history, we call it hierarchy of scale, when people are represented by how important they are and not how they actually looked, and where basically important people are bigger. 
The notion of hierarchy is a very important part of Confucian teaching, which revolves around respecting authority, respecting one's elder, contributing to the community. Confucianism also teaches the importance of learning and self-perfection. The emperor is shown as serene and thoughtful. He is not allowing any emotion to rule him. Remember, he's one of a series of 13 perfected emperors. So this scroll, again, is emphasizing history and tradition, which is important to Confucian thought. So overall, this painting has a lot to say about the Confucian culture that dominated China for hundreds of years and really still has a big influence today. I didn't include this painting in your notes because it's just too hard to see. It's not in as anywhere nearly as good condition. But this is another Confucian-inspired work from slightly earlier. Uh, this shows a famous act of heroism. This was a famous Chinese tradition. Uh, we don't always know what is tradition and what is history, but certainly there are many accounts of this. So Lady Feng was the wife of Han Emperor Yuan Dui. And he's saving her, she is shown saving her husband's life by placing herself between him and an attacking bear. This is a perfect model of Confucian behavior. She's showing honor to a superior. She's showing submission to her husband, even in a very, admittedly, in a very tough, broad sort of way. And she's demonstrating her commitment to preserving the community. By the way, armed guards rescue her, showing that they follow Confucius's teaching as well. So now I'm moving on to our last topic, if you get this far. I've talked about how the Chinese from the Zhou dynasty on were very influenced by Confucianism. But Confucianism was really a philosophy, a way to live, not a religion. Two religions also became very important to the Chinese, Taoism and then Buddhism. The historic Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, was born sometime around 560 BCE, but it would take more than 500 centuries for Buddhism to spread across northern India and into China along the Silk Road. That was the caravan route that brought silks and other Chinese trade goods west of the Roman Empire and later Christian Europe. You see a map of it here. Buddhism faced some obstacles as its missionaries reached China. First, the Chinese had no tradition of reincarnation. As you may recall, Buddhism was very heavily focused on helping people overcome what was really seen as the curse of continuous reincarnation. But that didn't mean a lot to the Chinese. They really didn't believe in it. Moreover, Confucian society was focused on social relationships, not on individual self-realization. It was also very hierarchical, you know, paying attention to who was on top in status terms. And Buddhism was created in part as a reaction to the rigid hierarchy of the caste system in India. And finally, to the extent that Chinese society looked to the past, it looked not to earlier incarnations of oneself, but to ancestors. I'm going to return to this in a second, but let me note that another religious tradition, really somewhere between a philosophy and a religion, that fit in better with Buddhism uh, was Taoism. Taoism focused on unity with nature and a way that put a person into harmony with his or her environment. And there was a lot of fusion between Taoism and Buddhism. Actually, there was also a lot of uh, fusion between Confucianism and Buddhism. Buddhism did quite a bit of adapting, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, this also isn't in your notes, but it's so beautiful, I really wanted to include it. Taoism did have a major impact on Chinese art, and especially landscape paintings. Because there was so much of a focus on nature, many Chinese artists, by the way, including Chinese Buddhist artists, did spectacular landscapes. So I've mentioned that the Tang Dynasty was the height of Confucian-inspired art, but Actually, Confucianism was not the official religion of China under the Tang Dynasty. When the Tang Dynasty reunified much of China around 600 CE, its emperors decided that one way to help adopt the, the to, to create unity would be to adopt Buddhism as the state religion and to show both the importance of Buddhism and their own power and glory, Tang emperors built these huge monuments that became pilgrimage sites for Buddhists. So basically, these were places that were designed to bring people from all over the kingdom to worship Buddha, to contemplate nirvana, and of course, to be made very aware of the glory 
of the Tang Dynasty. Probably the most famous Tang ruler was actually an empress, Wu Zaitan. She was the Hatshepsut of China, if you remember that female pharaoh. And like Hatshep, Hatshepsut, I'm sorry, I always pronounce that wrong. <coughs> she needed to reinforce her claim to rule, since she was, after all, a woman. So one of her strategies, like her Egyptian predecessor, was erecting monumental religious art. She personally paid for much of this complex of caves. It was filled with gigantic statues of the Buddha and his followers. So right off the bat, what do we learn about Tang culture from seeing these monuments? The dynasty was out to impress with huge statues and major monuments. I don't know if you have time, but this video clip from the Asian Art Museum would give you a feeling for the entire complex. This art also demonstrates how Buddhism changed when it arrived in China. As Buddhism spread, it divided into two strands of belief. And this is kind of an oversimplification, but live with it. The older and more traditional form of Buddhism continued to focus on individual enlightenment and self-sacrifice. This was the form of Buddhism that really took hold in Southeast Asia, for example. But the Chinese much preferred the newer Mahayana version of Buddhism, which focused on the entire community receiving enlightenment, as opposed to individuals seeking solitary perfection. In other words, like Confucianism, Mahayana Buddhism focused on an individual's role as part of society. Even the Buddha was no longer portrayed as a solitary individual. Instead, uh, Chinese Mahayana Buddhists worshipped multiple Buddhas and often portrayed them together. Some of these Buddhas represented the Buddha's past, before he achieved enlightenment, then there was the historical Buddha, or Shakyamuni, and then others, like the Virakana Buddha shown here, Virokan, excuse me, Buddha shown here, were Buddhas who had actually achieved nirvana. So the central Buddha here in this photo is the cosmic Buddha, or Virokana Buddha, the Buddha of boundless time and space. On either side of the Buddha are bodhisattvas and other guardian figures. Again, this is communal Buddhism. It's also a Buddhism that's focused on eternal salvation. So bodhisattvas were new figures in Buddhism, and they were especially important to Chinese Buddhism. Basically, bodhisattvas were individuals who could have entered nirvana. They had achieved enlightenment. But instead, these individuals in the best Confucian tradition decided to stay back on earth to help other people achieve enlightenment. Usually these bodhisattvas were portrayed as wealthy individuals, high-born, again, reflecting the Chinese respect for hierarchy and the upper classes. So this slide gives you a closer look at the bodhisattvas from the Longman Caves, or a couple of them. Notice how richly they're dressed, how much jewelry they're wearing. The idea of a poor, self-denying Buddha has undergone some transformation as Buddhism moved to China. Well, that's enough art, probably more than enough. Good luck on your essays. Remember, stay focused on the question, write in complete sentences, and use specific evidence to support two things that the art uh, that you've chosen teaches about Chinese culture from that era.